University student Jake Smith had been given a rather strange assignment. Investigate the notorious abandoned Disney resort, Treasure Island. The once grand attraction featured classic characters like Pete, Daisy, Minnie, and Mickey, but when Jake arrives, he finds the mascots have been twisted into horrific, demonic abominations. Oh! Oblitas Casa might be the perfect Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. The long-awaited sequel to Five Nights at Treasure Island is here, and it was worth the wait. It's among the most impressive FNAF fan games ever made. Like juniors before it, every inch of Oblitas Casa oozes style and substance, and it raises the bar when it comes to what we expect out of a free fan game. The visuals are top tier, the game mechanics are fun and nerve-wracking, the voice acting is good, and the jump scares are over the top and exciting. Out of here. Oh my god! More than anything else though, it's clear that an immense amount of care and effort went into making this game, and the excruciating attention to detail really shows in the final product. Five Nights at Treasure Island was one of the first FNAF fan games ever, and certainly one of the first popular ones. I kinda wanted to talk to him. <laughs> What the f- Created by Anart 1996 the fan game combined the gameplay of Five Nights at Freddy's with the creepypasta abandoned by Disney. In the years that followed, Anart would release the materials used to make the game, and they encouraged other fan game developers to create their own Treasure Island entries. Among these developers was Team Radiance, a controversial fan game collective spearheaded by Nocturna. Radiance has made a lot of games, and they've all been incredibly well received, so naturally I had really high expectations going into Oblitas Casa. I mean, it's Radiance's highly anticipated sequel to Five Nights at Treasure Island. Of course it's gonna be good, right? Your friends are dead. I'm here to help you. The music on the cameras fools him. Distant sounds are less effective than close ones. Use that to your advantage. Check this notepad frequently. Night one seemed straightforward enough, and I began luring Mickey, or Willie, around. Willie is the poster boy of Oblitas Casa and the main tune Jake encounters throughout the main nights, a distorted image of Mickey from the mouse's animated debut, Steamboat Willie. I thought that I had a pretty good handle on things when suddenly... It turns out that the instruction to check this notepad frequently wasn't just for more tips. Throughout the night, a dark face begins to draw itself on our notepad, Belial. Belial is a newly formed tune and is practically a toddler. As we lure Mickey around, we need to periodically check the notepad and erase any traces of her lest she fully form in the office. Once I had this figured out, I cruised through night one without much difficulty, the night's horrors giving way to the dawn. Afterwards, we find ourselves in the vents below the attraction. We need to use our flashlight and compass to navigate and locate the source of a ringing sound. But we're not alone in the vents. A voice calls out to us as we frantically search for the exit. The flashlight makes a loud buzzing noise and we need to turn it off in order to hear the ringing. At least, in theory. In practice, I just zigzagged through each row in the vents until I eventually found the exit. We'll just keep zigzagging through until we get it. I can't believe that worked. The game thankfully saves after each night, and brute forcing these segments is pretty easy. They're cool and intense and moody and atmospheric, so it's kind of a shame that it's more efficient to just spam your way through them than it is to actually play it as intended. In addition to Willy and Belial, Night 2 introduces the horrifying Daisy, a tune with the head of Daisy Duck and a set of tentacles protruding from its neck. When it appears on a camera, you need to flash it as quickly as you can. If you don't, it appears in your office and then temporarily disables whichever camera it was on. Furthermore, the player must listen for banging noises coming from the attic. These aren't friends getting frisky, this is the next enemy, the face. Visibly decayed since Fnati, the face returns with new, seemingly human body parts. He's smarter and more self-aware than the other tunes, and upon hearing crashes from the attic, you need to climb up there and use your lighter to drive the face away, quickly. Of course, everyone else is still active during this period, so you need to make sure they're taken care of before heading up to the attic. However, if you ignore the face for too long, Upon dying, the player awakens in post-mortem, a sort of bonus round to get an extra life, one more chance at the night you just died on. Armed with your best friend, a Mickey Mouse voodoo doll, the player is tasked with locating three Mickey dolls within the cameras. If you can find them before being killed, again, you'll come back to life and get another shot at the night you just died on. Otherwise, it's game over and you need to start the level all over again. 
This is an awesome looking level with some truly twisted animatronic designs. It gives the game some much needed color and variety in the visuals. Unfortunately, in the release version of the game, there aren't any instructions whatsoever, so whether or not I succeeded was mostly just a matter of luck. When Red Pants here appeared in my office, I just flipped the camera up and ignored him, and that seemed to work. You're apparently supposed to pick up the voodoo doll and stab it with a pin sometimes, but that always just caused me to die instantly, so I ignored it completely. On top of all of this, it turns out there are also fake Mickey plushies, and if you go to click them, Donald gets all up in your grill and screams at you for like 10 seconds. <laughs> I didn't realize this and thought that I was just horribly unlucky and kept getting screamed at by Donald moments before I clicked on a plushie. I did manage to beat it a few times, but without knowing what to do it felt very random. It's a cool section, it's like they put a whole separate fan game within their fan game, Junior's Final Boss style, and I love how beating it gives you one more chance at the night you just lost. Still, it needs some instructions. I'm sure the upcoming patch will include them. After finishing the night and then haphazardly clicking through the vents until we stumble into the exit, we begin night 3. This night introduces Photo Negative Minnie, who appears hanging from the dining room ceiling. A few moments later, she'll drop down to the ground and head straight for your office. You need to flash her with the camera after she's fallen down, or she'll kill you. While Oblitas Casa doesn't have a battery or power management system, both the sound lure and the camera flash operate on a cooldown system, so you can't spam them freely. Both Spider Daisy and Photo Negative Mini are dispelled by the camera, but you need to prioritize Mini, as Spider Daisy doesn't actually kill you, she just yells at you and then disables one camera. Plus, the disabled camera is only temporary, it comes back eventually. Whereas Mini, Mini just kills you. Night 3 took me a couple of tries, but once I got a handle on keeping Mickey in the corner, listening for the dude in the attic, erasing the notepad, and checking for Minnie periodically, I got through it without too much trouble. Another click fest through the service tunnels under the attraction, and we soon find ourselves in Night 4. This is where the true Oblitas Casa begins. In addition to all the prior night's threats, there's now this horrifying goofy looking dude named Dippy coming for us. He enters through the top door and tries to get to the deck. If he does, he'll tap on the window leading into your room and you have only a few seconds to lure him away using the audio. If you don't, he'll smash the window and uh, well. I played the music! Both Mickey and Dippy respond to the audio lore, which can become pretty hectic and crazy, but I actually found stacking the two characters in a single room and constantly calling them back there to be the most reliable strategy. While Mickey basically always responds to a sound from an adjacent room, Dippy is pickier. It feels like there are some rooms that he just doesn't want to go in, and it's a lot harder to lure him to them. Fortunately, Dippy basically always responds to a lore in Cam 8, as it's the same room you call him to when he's at the window about to kill you. Thus, this is the perfect spot to stack him and Mickey, allowing you to keep track of them both. This also sometimes lets you use the same music to call them both at once, saving yourself some cooldown time. The game throws one final curveball at us with Pete, who sometimes appears in the attic instead of the face. Pete is one of Disney's oldest characters, predating even Mickey Mouse himself, and he's often portrayed as the latter's foil. If you hear a noise from upstairs, climb up, but see this dude sitting there, quickly close the lighter and leave the attic. He won't bother you as long as you don't shove a light in his face and bother him. In theory, it's a nice way to keep you on your toes when you enter the attic, but in practice, the moment you enter, you either hear the face's music or you don't. If there's music, you know it's the face and you just use the lighter. If there's no music, you know it's Pete and you just leave. They may want to patch that so that the same music plays for both of them, because right now it's, it's too easy. Regardless, Night 4 is difficult. I struggled a lot, dying to the level 10 times before eventually completing it. We have to check Attic. Oh f We won! We won! Oh, dude, I made the I made the worst mistake at the last second, but we won anyway. Oh, thank God. He was I heard he was rapping on the window, and I thought it was someone in the attic, and I went to check the attic. That was guaranteed death had it not been uh, 6 a.m. right there. The morning sun has driven them back into darkness. After one more rather uneventful trip through the service tunnels, we're treated to one of the coolest cinematics I've ever seen in a FNAF fan game. No. 
No. No. No, 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 no! What did you do? They were children. My children. I took them under my care. I protected them. They did nothing to you people until you. They didn't know why you were doing anything to them. They didn't even understand what you wanted. They were scared. And you killed them. You people shouldn't have come here. I shouldn't have led you. I've seen what you people do here. in something they can't understand. Every time they push and prod and hope to deep, you don't even realize that the grass you step on, the air you breathe, it's all me. I've always been here. Every single time. Even if you didn't realize it. Even if you didn't recognize me. I have been here forever. And I will be here forever. Even after the countless amount of times I've seen this play out. The eternities I've spent with you. I never thought you'd go this far. I was wrong to let you pollute this place. To walk all over me. As long as I did. I was wrong not to deal with you a long, long time ago. It will all end here. I will make sure of it. In the heart of the tunnels beneath the island, Jake once again encounters Hourglass, an amalgamation made up of all the other Treasure Island characters. After the events of the first game, Hourglass was doomed to aimlessly roam the island's forests and sewers, slowly decaying before eventually finding their way back here somehow. Don't worry about it. Hourglass is burned to death in a furnace, Jake having put an end to them once and for all. Killing Hourglass seems to really piss off Mother, who is apparently rather fond of the Treasure Island mascots. Night 5 sees a squaring up against them, and while they're only a single mascot, Mick Mick is able to take on characteristics and gameplay mechanics from the earlier night's enemies. The key is to pay attention to Mickey's eyes. When he has pupils, you need to flash the camera at him, driving him away from your office and towards the deck. When Mickey has no pupils, he can be lured via audio, just like earlier nights. The only other animatronic present on Night 5 is the face, who according to the notepad is the only one that isn't under her control. Oh, did I mention the notepad is active and in fact is more dangerous than ever? You need to erase it constantly, and even when you do, the Mickey face is already reappearing just moments later. My strategy for Night 5 was to drive Mickey onto the porch so I could monitor him through the window. Once I got him there, I'd hold up the notepad and wait. The Mickey face can't appear while you're holding the notepad, so this just saves on some erasing. If you have downtime and nothing else to do, hold the notepad. Every few seconds, check the window. If Mickey is gone, he's in camera 8. Flash him again and send him back to the porch. If you hear anything in the attic, it's the face. Go get rid of him. Unlike prior nights, you'll need to use the lighter on him between 6 and 9 times before he'll go away, so make sure Mickey is at the end of the house before heading up there. As long as you follow those instructions, phase 1 is effortless. It's literally as easy as night 1. It's impossible to die. However, halfway through the night, Mick Mick evolves into... 
Mikazard, I guess, and this is where the night falls apart. In theory, the mechanics are all the same. Mickey is just way more aggressive and moves more quickly. The margin of error becomes lower, and you have to become quicker than before, and there's very little room for downtime. Scratch that, there's no downtime whatsoever. Mickey is just too fast. I'd send him literally as far away as he could possibly be, right before heading up to the attic to take care of the face. Yet by the time I get back, Mickey is right outside my door. I flash him back a room, but by the time my camera charges back up for another flash, he's already back in the room outside ours. I can stall him for a little bit and even push him back slightly, you know, maybe a room or two, but eventually the face will show up in the attic again or I'll need to go erase Belial from the notepad and at that point you're just dead. I suspect this is one of the main reasons the game was taken down just a few hours after release. Everything up until now has been fine. Sure, a couple of things ought to have had instructions and they didn't, but that's nothing a quick FAQ on Game Jolt couldn't tackle. Unfortunately, Phase 2 of Night 5 was just so imbalanced, it, it really did need a rework. The developers are fixing it as I write this, and it's probably resolved by the time you're seeing this. Upon completing the night, the sun rises and we're treated to the following cutscene. Oblitus Casa is really a special game. Like Juniors before it, it sets a new bar for what a FNAF fan game can be. It's as polished and fully featured as any of Scott's original FNAF games, and while it builds on their ideas, I think it's ultimately a better, more fun game than any of them. It's also a true fan game. I'd argue that games like Flumpties, Popgoes, Candies, Grizzlies, and more aren't really fan games. They all have their own casts, their own gameplay, and they could all stand on their own without any FNAF association whatsoever. Treasure Island is unique in that there's no way a game like this could ever be made commercially. Disney would never agree to something like this, and you could never monetize it. This is the kind of game that can only exist as a fan game, and I think that's kind of cool. It truly leverages the fan game format in every way possible, and I think it's a much better game as a result. Check out Oblitus Casa on Game Jolt. By the time you're watching this, I'm sure the patched version is out, so give it a try. It's free, and it's really worth playing. A lot of effort and passion went into it, and it shows. Everyone on Team Radiance who contributed to this game should be really proud. It's a really cool game. Thanks so much for watching.